these recipes that my grandmother wrote down for me were from my great, great, great grandmother who mm. had a bakery in Kiev. What I also didn't realize is that me asking my grandmother to write them down was the very first time they'd ever been written down because they were all told verbally. This is Taste. I'm your host, Matt Rodbard. Zoe Francois is a professional pastry chef, recipe consultant, cookbook author, food photographer, and baking instructor, and the host of Zoe Bakes on Magnolia Network. Man, she is busy. I recently spoke with her live at Rizzoli Bookstore in New York City to talk about the subject of her latest book, Cookies. Her new book is Zoe Bakes Cookies, and it's honestly one of my favorite books in this category in many, many years. We get into so many great tips for baking the perfect chocolate chip cookie, snickerdoodle, peanut butter cookie, and other Midwestern favorites. Man, I love how Zoe focuses on the Midwest. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for waiting. Uh, Welcome to Rizzoli Bookstore. We're very glad to have you here tonight. It's our first event of the fall season, and uh, we're here to celebrate Zoe Bakes Cookies by Zoe Francois, the lovely pastry chef and TV host and author of the award-winning Zoe Bakes Cakes. We're very lucky to have her here visiting uh, New York tonight. Um, And she's joined by Matt Rodbard, the author most recently of the cookbook, uh, Koreatown, and he's the founding editor of Taste as well. Um, And we're we're recording this live for the This Is Taste podcast uh, as part of our ongoing series with them. So very lucky to have them both here. Yes, come on up. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, They're going to be in conversation together for about 40 minutes or so uh, with some time for your questions after. And, and let's give them both a very warm welcome, Matt and Zoe. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you, Christine. Lovely crowd. Sold out. And we have Julia Tertian here in conversation with Eliza Barbernell in October, so we'll be posting that on Taste. We're recording this live for our podcast, This Is Taste. You can always download it on all the, all the places you get podcasts. And thank you, Clayton, for recording it. We have our gentleman in the front. Hello. Thank, welcome to your release day. How are you feeling? Today's the day. I love um, that one's release day. How are you yeah, feeling? It's it's amazing and surreal. I mean, you spend three years working on something and then all of a sudden it's alive and in people's hands and it's crazy to see you holding it. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> I love Well, it's, it's really a terrific book and we're going to go over lots of the recipes and techniques, um, why the cookie was uh, your point of interest. But first, you landed in New York. I'd like to get a sense of where have you been going out while here? Restaurant-wise, this isn't your hometown, but I'm sure you have some spots. Oh, yeah. Um, well, so far, I've been to Best Szechuan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which was amazing. Um, I'm going to um, check out a new bakery. It's not even actually open, but it's going to open soon. It's called Hani mm. um, by Miro. And yeah. he was the pastry chef at Gramercy Tavern. And um, I'm very excited about that. My cousin just opened a new restaurant, um, Vaudor? La Vaudor. La Vaudor. La Vaudor. Right. Yeah. So those are the two places I'm... Oh, and also uh, Bar Contra. Yeah, great. Great. Yes. You, you you hit Eater, you hit Grub Street, you got all the spots. So yes. Yes. let me ask you, when you go to a town and you visit for either producing te- your television show or just doing tour, like how do you organize the bakeries that you're going to go to? Uh, I feel like you're often probably pulled into a lot of directions. Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, I pull Instagram. Yeah. Um, And I ask everybody for their recommendations. If I'm going into a city I don't know that well, or at least get opinions. And then my son, Charlie, who's here, (laughs) um, makes me an Excel spreadsheet. And then my friend Stephen is my navigator. And he takes the spreadsheet and we have a map and we hit. I think when I did the cake book, we hit. 43 slices of cake in three days. Amazing. In what city? Here. In New York. In New York. And then we did the same thing with cookies. Let's go top three in New York cake oh. slices. Can we just do that oh. right now? I didn't prep you for that. But no, you didn't prep me for I that. I didn't. Okay. Or just one. But that we're, we're... was a long time ago. Okay. So I don't, that was like pre-pandemic. Okay. So I don't know if they would Pandemic still, brain. yeah. 
I this was that was like a little bit of like a, a funny question, but you are so serious and I respect that. So when you're doing 43 cakes in a city yeah. and you're researching a book or yeah. when you were researching this book. So what, how are you gaining this knowledge? How are you how are you going to the bakeries? Walking. <laughs> That's how I can eat 43 slices of cake <laughs> is because we are literally walking 43 miles yeah. to get them. I love that. Yeah. So I, you have a lot of opportunities after your after your, your last book before this one to, to to start going down this route of single topic. And I believe your career will end up going in this direction for future books. But why Zoe focus on the cookie for this book yeah. when you could have gone in other directions? Um, I actually thought cookies would be the first one. Oh, OK. Yeah, because I started my career um, doing cookies. And so I thought that would be the first one. Um, but. Jane, my agent, and I discussed that there were so many cookie books coming out that year um, that we postponed that and went for cakes, which is my was my other obsession at the time. So I always I knew that this would be like a series of yeah. books, single subject series, so I could like deep dive into each one. I'm really, really glad that cookies was sort of put on hold and came out now because it's a book that I hadn't visualized when I first was thinking of cookies. This book became so much more than what I anticipated. Um, so it was a real journey and it wouldn't have been ready back then. I mean, there are even more cookie books now than there were four years ago. And still it's here and it's exceptional. And it, it's a book that offers Cookie Cat the Academy in the front of the section, in the front of the book, and then a lot of recipes that show innovation. I guess when you're look when you're looking at your spreadsheet or whiteboard and you're saying, I'm gonna write a cookie book in 2024, like what are you trying to articulate for this category that has been published extensively? Yeah, that's so um okay. So first of all, I thought that I knew exactly what this book was gonna be. Um, I started a cookie company when I was in college. Um, I was taking a business class and we had to write a fictitious business plan. And my business plan was a cookie company. And it was like of the era of, um, you know, uh, Famous Amos and David's Cookies and Mrs. Fields. And so I wrote it based on that. And then after I wrote it, I decided it looked like a whole lot more fun than sitting in school. So I dropped out of school and I started the company. Uh, I did go back. I did graduate. But um, so I, so that was my beginning. And so I thought that it would be sort of the cookies that I've baked in my career and then um, it took a turn, and I realized that um, not only were they the cookies that I baked in my career and through restaurants and all of that, but it was also family recipes. Yeah. And those took a hold of me in a way that I didn't see coming um, and sort of took over the book. And it became way more of almost memoir told through cookie yeah. recipes. Um, and I ended up learning things about my family and myself um, that I had no idea um, until I was doing the research for this What's book. one thing that you learned through the process that maybe, like, upon reflection was, like, a big reveal? I would say there's a chapter in the book um, about Bubby Berkowitz um, recipes. And yeah. my I had asked my grandmother, uh, Sarah Berkowitz, for a couple of recipes. This was, like, 10 years ago. And when I was doing this book, she had passed away. So I called my mom and I was talking to her about these, these recipes and asked her if she had any memories of them. And I ended up hearing stories that I hadn't ever heard of before. These recipes that my grandmother wrote down for me were from my great, great, great grandmother who mm. had a bakery in Kiev. Um, baked uh, to bring joy because that's what bakers do, but also to survive. Uh, they were doing this in order to survive and live and then to eventually raise enough money to move to America. Wow. Um, what I also didn't realize is that 
me asking my grandmother to write them down was the very first time they'd ever been written down because they were all told and passed down verbally. Um, none of these women until my grandmother could read or write. And wow. so they would teach the next generation, skipping my mother. <laughs> yeah. She won't mind because uh, everybody knows she can't be. <laughs> <laughs> All your fans. I've, I've written about it extensively. It, it, it's a, is it like a little, it's a thing. That you, it's a yeah, thing. Right, it's a it. thing. Okay. But it's, it turns out to be great because I yeah. send her all the recipes. She tests them. And if she can make them, yeah. then I know everybody <laughs> can do it. Um, but that was one. It's, I think that story changed the book for me. And I it just became, um, you know, there's there's recipes and stories about growing up in the commune. And I mean, I ate uh, really bleak things <laughs> on that commune. There's a lot of carob. It was a lot of oh, the carob. Um, <laughs> and I'm still in therapy over it. And my dad and I have discussed it at, yeah. at length. But um, but there were, you know, but now that I'm an adult, I really kind of appreciate some of those recipes, but I wanted to make them delicious. Yeah. Well, you have a healthful chapter. Yeah. We call them so, healthful cookies. Yeah, it's an exactly. Homage. So, yeah. but it was because of the commune that that chapter became a thing. So each chapter is a part of my life. It sort of tells the story of that era of my life. Let's go back briefly for the listeners of the show and, and those who don't know, you were hustling cookies out of a cart in Vermont. Yes. And that was like the beginning of your professional baking career. But it was cookies where you got your start. And yeah. it was during the moment, as you mentioned, Famous Amos and, and Mrs. Fields and and uh, and many other brands. What was that like, like coming to the revelation that people would buy your cookies? Um, it was pretty remarkable since I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> And um, oftentimes they were edible, but barely. <laughs> so I think I looked, um, I think I was trying really hard and people recognized that. <laughs> um, and I learned a lot. I also worked at a little breakfast place and had sort of like learned a little bit about working in a kitchen. But I also bought my first um, KitchenAid mixer. Yeah. I think within the first week of having it, I threw a solid block pound of butter into it frozen. Uh, Don't do this. This is a cautionary tale. The engine. And strip the gears. Yeah, the gears mess. Yeah. Just done. Yeah. Gone. Um, Hobart was down the street and they rebuilt it for me. Um, I learned so much from doing that. Um, one thing, and you'll see it in this book, is I talk a lot about how to get your cookies to be consistent because when I was doing that cookie cart, they were never <laughs> consistent. You'd come one day, they'd be this big. The next day they were, you know, saucers. So, yeah. Well, we're going to get into Cookie Academy a little bit. I have like specific questions I think would be revealing to some of the tips. But one, um, I'd love to hear about the portion spoon for uh -huh. cooking as a verb. I feel like some folks maybe don't have portion spoons, but if you watch your videos or watch your television show, it's kind of essential. Explain why the portion spoon actually can help you. Um, I have an entire drawer system of scoops, yeah. the portion scoops. This is something um, that you learn immediately in culinary school or working in a restaurant environment is one, it just makes life easier to scoop things out of a portion scoop, but also consistency. So, um, and I have them in every size, but when you're baking cookies and you put a tray of cookies into the oven and some are the size of a quarter and some are, you know, the size of a baseball, they're going to bake differently. So using a portion scoop, obviously you're going to have all the same size and they just bake more evenly. How do you know which one to use? That's the biggest uh, problem too, uh, because like sometimes they get too small. I mean, that's yeah. really the challenge. Okay. And then a perfectly round cookie too. I mean, yeah. all these questions. Okay. Every single recipe tells you exactly which ah, scoop that's great. to use. Um, so, but... So Sometimes you don't want that size. So um, there is the Baking Academy where I talk about it. But, you know, if you use the size that I recommend for the recipe, it'll work as 
I say. Yeah. But, you know, I, I want people to also feel free to do what they want to do with it. So if they want a smaller cookie, use a smaller scoop. But then you have to bake it for less amount of time. But I talk about that in the book. As yeah, well. it's 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 great how concise you you make these tips, and of course there's QR codes, and you can find yourself baking through your videos as well. Now, audience, please be thinking about questions for Zoe about baking cookies or baking anything or really anything. We're going to take them at the end of the conversation. I want to ask you about freezing and chilling dough before baking. As a novice baker, I always mess this up. I feel like my dough is too cold. My dough is not cold. I don't think ahead of time. So is there a tip that we can take away f about thinking about the freezing and chilling of dough? And what exactly does that do? Okay. It depends on the cookie. Yeah. Um. So some cookies, you want to bake them cold. Um. If you chill the dough, like if you make a chocolate chip cookie and you bake it right away, the butter is soft, everything is room temperature, it's going to spread more. Mm -hmm. If you chill it first, it's not going to spread as much. If you chill it for an hour, it'll set up a little bit. If you chill it for a couple of days, not only will it set up more, but everything sort of marries together. Mm -hmm. Like the the ingredients absorb together and they just become more harmonious and they taste different. They behave differently. Wow. They get chewier sometimes. So chilling can really change a cookie substantially. Um, for the better, mostly. And for There's the better, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm trying to think of a time, like I do have like a super crispy chocolate chip cookie in the book. And that's one of the places where I say bake it right away because you want it to spread. You want it to caramelize. You want it to, you know, get lacy and yeah. crinkly. I mean, there's lots of charts and you you have a progression for the, the from like chewy to crispy. And there's real science obviously behind it. And I guess for those who maybe don't think of themselves as math and science folks, but want to actually dive in. Can you reassure us that we can make cookies like you? Because there's a little bit of a hurdle. For some okay. Folks. So first of all, I put a baking academy in all of my books and I put it in its own little section because um, I just did... Um, a YouTube live yesterday and my mom watched it and she called me. She's like, you are such a nerd. <laughs> and I'm like, I am and I love it. And it, I love to geek out on these things. And so I put it in one place because I want people to have the information. I want them to be able to deep dive in some of this stuff. Um, and also it's, it's like if you have your grandmother's recipe and she's called for a walnut sized piece of butter and a handful <laughs> of flour, it's yeah. like, what do you do with you, that? By that digital scale. Yeah. It's yeah. like, so, so some, so I want people to be able to take this baking academy and, you know, be able to move through my book, but also be able to learn something about some of the other recipes they've been struggling with. Or you can just leave it alone. You do not ever have to look at that chapter. If you want it, it's there. And I always refer to it in the recipe. But I didn't want to weigh each recipe down with a lot of, yeah. like, geeking out for people who just want to bake a cookie. So it's there for you if you want it. And it's there for you if you want to ignore it. <laughs> Great. Just great. I, I think that's very smart to keep the writing extremely crisp, pun intended, while you have your academy at the beginning. Okay, let's talk about chocolate chip cookies for one second. So we know chocolate chip, chip cookies are a matter of preference, right? But with that said, if you were to isolate one element of the chocolate chip cookie for all home bakers to focus more on, what would that one element be? Okay, there's a couple of things just generally about recipes. And this is really true for most baking, if not all baking, is pay attention to the temperature. So if a recipe calls for room temperature eggs or butter or anything else, 
um, they need to be room temperature okay. because when you're creaming something together and you're using room temperature butter, it's like magic. It just sort of happens and it's quick. If you're trying to do that with like solid butter, you're struggling with it and it's never going to sort of um, emulsify as cleanly. Is that like an hour at room temperature? Yeah, it's like an minutes? hour, but it also depends. Like, do you live in Savannah or do you live in Minneapolis? Okay. It's like, so, and I also give lots and lots of tips on how to warm butter because yeah. sometimes you want cookies in an emergency or like you haven't prepared for it and yeah. it's like, I need these. Um, yeah. And so I, I have some tips on how to get things to room temperature, the eggs, the butter, all of that. So we have butter as one. What's butter. another element for the chocolate chip cookie that we should really focus on? Um, I would say um, chocolate. Okay. Because it's the star yeah. of the whole situation. Um, I am not here to suggest that you use one type of chocolate. Um, I have my favorites. They're in the book. Whatever your favorite is, um, is great. But just remember that that's the star of it. I have to say, though, that uh, there is a new trend of um, chocolate-free chocolate chip cookies. Oh. Awkward pause. Awkward pause. I don't know. What do you think? I think they need a new name. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do know that some people like more chocolate and less chocolate. Chips or chunks? Them. What works best? Um, okay, so I do like chunks. Yeah. Yeah. Those... I feel like the chips ha oftentimes have um, fat and additives to them to prevent yeah. them from losing that chip shape. Agree. And like when we're standing in our fancy bakery and paying like $5.75 for a chocolate chip cookie, they're usually chunks, I yes. would say. Yes. So. And and chunks are just sexier. Yeah. Like when you do, it's... and I teach you how to get that like perfect chocolate pool that you see on Instagram all the time. Um, there is a trick to that. Yeah. But the chunk will get you there. A few more questions. Okay. I want to win my office cookie competition. And literally at Penguin Random House where I work, Gina also works there, we have one every December. Oh. This is going to be online forever, so people oh, will be no. listening to it while they're preparing. <laughs> How do we do that with your book? Is there a recipe that is so unexpected or maybe so easy that we that we need to go to it to win that competition? Yeah, okay, there is... Um, okay, this is going to be a very weird one, but it's... Uh, they're these Super Bar Bowl... Uh, bars? Super Bowl Bars. Oh, it sounds amazing. Say that 10 times fast. Um, and my recipe tester said... I don't even know what this is or what I am eating, but I can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> they're just like wow. layers of things and they have pretzels and, and oh. potato chips and they're so weird and they're so good. So what's the weird? I mean, I'm hearing pretzels. I'm yeah, hearing bar. Just, yeah. What's it's else? Just, it's just sort of like all the Super Bowl snacks in. Oh, a, I get it now. In one place. So you don't have to like get up from the couch. I lo and they're are they easy to make? Yes, they're easy to make. Bars are easy. They're okay. easy to make. Um, bless you for putting a Midwestern chapter in the book. I'm from West Michigan myself. Oh, you are. So, um, hell yeah. Yeah. And and let's talk about that. Midwestern baking, I think, gets shit on quite a bit by fancy really? coastal. Right? I think it, it, it's assumed that it's like mostly lemon bars. Yeah, there's a lot of lemon. Bars. I mean, it's but we bar. as Midwesterners. Uh -huh. I think kind of own like home baking yes. in many ways. I know there'll yes. be debates you can op offer that, that comment up later. Yeah. So tell us about Midwestern baking. Okay, well, your... there's a couple of things. I was very surprised when I moved there, the yeah. just intense, intense baking culture that goes on there. Yeah. Um, you have to, first of all, understand that Minneapolis what is a milling city. It is literally a city built on flour. And so it is the entire culture is built around things to do with flour. <laughs> um, but it's also has the culture of uh, Scandinavian immigrants and German immigrants. And they all have a super rich baking culture that has all 
um, touched down in that one place. And it's the home of Betty Crocker. Right. And so oh. so when I was when I was doing this book and I have all of my grandmother's recipes, this is my uh, father's mom. Um, and I would celebrate Christmas at her house and I have her recipe box. And I was um, you know, I would go to her house on during the holidays, coming from the commune, not being allowed to eat sugar and going there. And she would make like 12 different cookies. It turned out most of those cookies from her recipe box um, are from Betty Crocker. So <laughs> so I had to spend tweak time, them. I had to tweak a lot of yeah. them. Um, yeah, uh, they also have. um you know, this was back in the 60s and 70s. They also have gossip written on them, mm -hmm. um, trash talk, <laughs> um, all of her notes. Just about the tea the from neighbors. the day. Yes. Yeah. I mean, these are like some juicy. I love it. <laughs> Oh my! I mean, she was a piece of work. I love, I love the, the also like the bake sale in midwestern schools and yeah, churches, churches. Yeah, is such a thing that obviously Absolutely. it's everywhere, but it's big in the Midwest. Yeah, um, I did a few episodes of my show in church basements, um, and you know these lefsa parties where people would yeah. bring bowls um, that were hundreds of years old that their family had been mixing dough and cookies and lefsa in um and it, it's intense it's just an intense place and um there are lemon bars but there are so many other things yeah i love that we are thinking beyond the lemon bar from midwestern baking thank you for sharing and thank you for giving it its flowers a few more be thinking about your questions um is there a cookie that we should as home bakers just not tackle and just leave it for the pros there's no. got to be one that's like only for the semi pros. No, no, no. I I disagree with that. I think that there are some that you probably won't nail the first time you go for it. But I think that that's I I think people get hung up on success of a recipe and um put too much pressure on themselves. And a lot of what I've learned um over the years and just in general, is uh, mostly comes from when I fail and fail hard. And so I feel like people need to give themselves room to try mm -hmm. a project that might be a little bit of a stretch. For you, what is a, what is a cookie that is a, a little bit of a stretch? Well, which... I would say macarons tend to be... Yeah. Um, you know, maybe it, it's almost like a feeling that yeah. you get when you're mixing the dough, when you have that macronage that happens in the bowl. This is all in the book. So you can read yeah. that. It's basic. What that means is stir. <laughs> it's just fancy stirring. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean, there are things about that recipe um, that can be a little bit... Um, what about laminated doughs and croissants? Do you, yeah. do, you, do you mess with those a little bit? Yeah, there's a, a quick puff pastry there is, yeah. in the book because uh, there, I have a rugula recipe in there and there's two different doughs because um, depending on where you're from, um, some people do a cream cheese dough and some people do a laminated dough. A laminated dough is just, um, it's basically a dough that has layers of butter so that you get the flakiness. Um, and so it's more of a pastry. But in certain cultures, that's what rugula is made with. Yeah, so great. And it's so great. You could, but I like the cream cheese one, too. Yeah, the cream cheese one is the one, only one I've attempted. Yeah. Doing like your own lamination at home. it's super is, easy. Yeah, it's easier to do that. I think rugula is a great, great call. You obviously love doing television like you really it shows and i i mean really like it's a lot of work obviously and not all glamour tell us about what's what are you looking to do with your career on television I feel like this i mean really you're you you have so much to, to do shows travel what do you want to do um i would love to do more of them um and uh there's you know so far my show has been based in minnesota there's hundreds more stories to tell there, but there's 
lots of shows and lots of bakeries and lots of things to be done in Paris, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would love <laughs> to travel and do these things because, you know, we've been talking a little bit about the different culture of baking, and that plays a role in the book as well, like the different parts of of my childhood and my family and my DNA. Um but I learned a lot from just reading about other things and t and trying other recipes and discovering the world mm -hmm. through recipes. And I would love to actually go out and do that. So let's go Bourdain for a second. We've got Paris's number one, episode one, season one, episode one. So we've got four more episodes, five more. Where else are we going on your show? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, there's... There's a bunch of places I wouldn't necessarily go right now yeah. <laughs> that I would love to go and explore. Um, it really all, I can't think of a place yeah. that I wouldn't want to go and bake. Yeah. Um, because I feel like there's just, I feel like when you go to a place, I'm going to Sicily in the spring. Beautiful. Um, I've never been there, but I've been obsessed with it for a really long time. And I feel like whenever I go someplace, I always try to take a cooking class because I feel like you learn so much about the people and the place and the history through the food, mm -hmm. but not just eating the food, but also making it. Yeah. And making it with someone who who is of that place. So you've got set up like 47 bakeries in, pace, in, in Sicily on the spreadsheet already? Yes. I love yes, that. Yes, I do. Who you bring with you? Your, your son? No? Stephen. All right, Stephen. <laughs> Stephen's your, yeah. I love it. Stephen and I just went to uh, Venice uh, together and ate and ate and ate. I love we your style. Yeah. There's more we books coming, I would imagine. Yes, 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 there is. What do you want to do in your with your book career? Well, I got to talk to Jane first, and okay. then I'll tell you. All right, we'll we'll give. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll last section on this is taste. We ask guests about the discerning taste. So to close this interview, here's a little rapid fire, fast and furious taste check. Okay, you ready? The best fruit, passion fruit. Why so? And how do you bake with it? Okay, passion fruit is I think because it's unexpected. I don't know if you've all seen it, but it it has this like tough exterior, and then you break into yeah. it, and it's this like sour, um, uh, I'm like pulp. Yeah, it has pulpy. like tiny little seeds in it, but it has this. It's almost like the cross between a lime and a peach and a kiwi. Is Good. that right? I mean, fresh passion fruit is hard to find, so that's pretty nice. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, I get it shipped from California. Yeah. And it's awesome. The worst vegetable. I love all vegetables. There's got to be one that's know. not. Okay, like celery, just because yeah. it's boring. I agree. The yeah. product of the Midwest, so one yeah, of our I don't know, great exports. But I love, I can't think of any others. Fair I enough. love them. Okay, this is a big one, the best dessert. This is the taste check. You got to, you got to, you, you got to answer, man. Wait, the best dessert? There's got to be Are one. Are you kidding you can do 1A, 1B if no, you want, but... No, 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 no. Okay, this is like, it depends on my mood. I know, exactly. It depends on what the season. What comes to mind when you... Okay, Pavlova. Love that. Wow. Who expected Pavlova? Man, what a great call. <laughs> Your favorite American fast food chain. Okay, I can't... Uh... Um, okay, I'm just going to say this because it was my first job, Wendy's. Absolutely. I don't do fast food. But you have a like, personal connection. Like, I just connection. don't. Fair. Yeah. But you have a personal connection. Yep. That's was, it. it was the outfit. Did the the, the outfit. <laughs> so the frosty machine. I mean, I, I was the frosty girl. That is a yeah. tough thing to clean. The frosty. Oh, did I clean it? No, no. <laughs> I don't remember. That was a long time ago. So, but do you do you believe in the merits of the frosty? Yeah, I mean, I haven't had a frosty in decades, but at the time. I had a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Frosties. The trick to Frosties is dipping fries into the Frosty. Oh, yeah. The obviously. like salty and sweet. Love and that move. yeah. I feel like that's <laughs> a super important move in cookies too. The salty and sweet. Yeah. Good call. We're in a beautiful bookstore here at Rizzoli. I gotta ask the your favorite cookbook of all time. Oh wow. Again, okay, I have um I'm packing up my house um right now. And um, I didn't quite realize how out of control my cookbook collection was until I started packing them. And I'm on like box 30. 
So I have hundreds of them. And again, it's like, what's the mood? What is, um, okay, okay, so think. One that um, fell out and you're like, holy cow, that is a book. Okay. It's like the one that fell out of the box. Yeah. Does that come to mind? Anything? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Lee Bailey's Country Desserts. Yeah. No, this is the craziest, craziest answer. Um, and I don't know if any of you even know what I'm talking about. There's some thumbs up in the crowd. There's but some nodding. This was the first des- all dessert book that was gifted to me in high school. And um, I baked every single recipe in that That's really book. Great. So th- it's more nostalgia. I don't know that those recipes necessarily hold up today, but that would be it. Are you going to bake for Governor Tim Walls? I hope so. What? How can that happen? I don't know. I have baked for other Minnesota governors, so I'm hoping. Yeah. I'm What's the one thing as a Minnesotan that we don't know about about Tim Walls from your point of view? I don't know. I think you really are, you know, you get what you see right. with that one. Uh, I We were shocked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were a little bit shocked because um, he's just so non no nonsense and he's an excellent governor. Um, and he he's not sort of showy. And so we didn't mm-hmm. realize he was gunning for this kind of an office. He probably didn't realize. I don't know that he it. did either. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's pretty, he's been very effective. I, it feels like a ticket that has a lot of interest in food. Spiritually, yeah. cooking. Yeah. yeah. Well, she loves to, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I made a, a coconut cake. Oh, wow. Called it the column, uh, the Kamala coconut cake. Love that. Yeah. You can find it on threads. You're going to the White House. You're going to be baking there. It's going to happen anyways. Not that not that kind of show here. A few more. Um, your favorite city outside America to visit for food? Paris. Yeah, true. You spend yeah, a lot of time for there? Baking. Uh, no, not a ton of time. I went um, last fall, but it had been, I think, 30 years before that. Wow. Since I had Times been changed, before sure. that. You're yeah. packing up. Are you moving from Minnesota? Uh, I mean, you you mentioned on stage, so I'm just, <laughs> all right, no comment. I won't go there. Okay. I guess check check the internet for that one. Yes. Okay, great. If La- I knew, I would tell you. How about that? I love, wow. I mean, that's amazing. Well, I don't know yet. Exciting times for you. Yeah. Last one, your favorite sandwich. My boys moved out. Oh. That's a little, that, that was not meant to be like Jewish guilt. That was just a fact. <laughs> <laughs> I guess ch- ch- check the check the feed for updates yes. on this move. I yeah. love it. It's exciting right. times. Last one, your favorite sandwich? My favorite sandwich. Oh, okay. Um, there's a, well, okay. Um, I grew up in Westport, Connecticut. Partly, I went to sixteen schools before I graduated, so we moved around a lot. But Westport, Connecticut, after school, I would always have a hot pastrami on rye with extra mustard and pickles, and what I a- still. And I think we, we may head to Katz's later. Oh, it's because my son's never had a Katz's oh, wow. pastrami sandwich. It's definitely maybe the best. Yeah, one of the best. Langer's are pretty good too. But yeah, I love it. Well, thank you. Let's get open it up for questions from the audience. I feel like there's some folks who have great baking questions right there. I think we're gonna have a circulating microphone so we can catch this for the podcast. Right here, there's one there. Thank you. So congratulations on the new book. Very exciting. Great to have you here in New York. So since you're a bit of a geek, um, baking question, I inherited uh, family recipes. And I have to tell you, they're from like the 40s and 50s. So they're shortening for the fat. And I've tried swapping butter out straight and I've tried filling around with it and I continue to struggle. Any ideas? Yeah. Okay. So shortening... um... Is you'll see, I actually have a cookie in the book called Zoe's Perfect Cookies, and it uses some shortening. And it's because shortening doesn't spread the way that butter does. And so the consistency of it is so different. And the texture of the cookie and the crispness of the cookie is so different. So you can swap it out for coconut oil and butter and other sort of shortening replacements, because I know people don't always love baking with shortening. 
but there really isn't anything that's going to match that texture. So if you're going for a recipe that you remember that like the texture of it, the flavor of it, you're going to have to use the short name. Um, and there are, yeah, that's, that's the long and short of it, but you can change it, but it's like substituting any ingredient in a recipe. You're really changing the recipe. So to get it to be exactly that, um, you have to use that rest, that ingredient. Is there a brand of shortening that's better than the other? Well, there are different. Okay. So when I was in culinary school, there was, we could get shortening that is only available in industry. That's magical. And I've never been able to find it outside of like a five gallon mm. tub of it, <laughs> which is not, not really conducive yeah. to the home baking. Um, so, I mean, really, if you're going, you can buy some that are, you know, palm oil free and some that are more sustainable and um, maybe healthier for the environment. Cool. Um, yeah. Other questions, please. One right here. When you mentioned coming to the city and trying 43 slices of cake or 43 cookies in, in three days, are, I'm curious, are you trying them to compare them to your cookies or are you trying them to develop a new cookie? Yeah. I'm just so curious. Um, okay, so it was 43 slices of cake and 320 cookies. Wow. <laughs> yeah, because cookies, you know, there's more. You got to eat more. When I come to New York, I visit with some high school friends of mine, and I, one of them lives in Brooklyn, and I shoved 300 of those cookies in his freezer. So, um, yeah, so I gave him thanks in the book. <laughs> um, it's somewhat for inspiration. Like, do I love the texture of this? Do I love the flavor of it? Are they doing something incredible that I'm trying to reverse engineer to figure out what they've done? So sometimes it's flavor combinations. Sometimes it's texture. Um, sometimes it's because I have asked Instagram and they all said, you have to try this one. And so I do. Um, I don't always love them. And sometimes I super love them. Um, but yeah, so it's it's for a bunch of different reasons. Okay, so 33 years ago, my husband gave me a Lee Bailey cookbook. It was his first gift to me. Yeah. So thank you oh, for saying awesome. that. It was so sweet. Um, so if you're in my apartment with me here in New York, and I apologize to all the expert bakers, but you're in my apartment and I've just taken chocolate chip cookie dough out and I'm putting it on my cold counter. And I do a wee bit of flour, as you say. But it's off. Okay, so do I put it, because of, you mentioned temperature and it's a climate-controlled environment, do I put the dough back in the in the refrigerator or do I touch it to add more flour? Because that's where I get stuck. It's not consistent. I can make a great cookie, but not consistently. And so I'm wondering, what do you do? Okay, so, okay, walk me back with the wee bit of flour after the cookie dough is already done. Um, once the cookies are mixed and refrigerated, there's not a lot of changing them um, after the fact. So if you, like with this perfect cookie, and um, Matt alluded to the cookie lab in my book where I talk about like what will more flour do to your cookie? What will more egg do? What will more baking soda and the reverse of less? So I show you exactly what the consistency will be. What I often say is if you're going to play with the recipe, and I highly recommend that you play with the recipe, that's one of the reasons that I write the books the way that I do, is that I don't want people to feel like my recipes are the end all. It's really the beginning. It's like I want to give you enough information that you can take it and make it exactly how you want it. Um, but I would say start with... and. One of the things is using a scale is start with a half batch or even a quarter batch of the recipe so that if you love it, you can move forward and make a bunch of them. But if it's not exactly what you want, 
you start again, but you don't have a thousand of them now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But once you've mixed up the cookie batter and it's chilled and in the balls, you can try adding more. You can try bringing it to room temperature. This is really going off the rails here, guys. So just stay with me. <laughs> but I love the idea of it. So you can try it, like bring it to room temperature, add more flour. Uh, no guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> but good. let me know. Get in touch with me on Instagram. It's a, it's a view into your mind. Would just yeah, happen yeah. No, no, no. Because now I'm obsessed with this, and I will go I, home I love and that. defrost cookie dough and see if I add more stuff to it. A few more. Here we go. Great. Let's take like this one and maybe two more, <laughs> and then we'll see where we're at. Hi, I have a two part question. Please. I'm so scared of this. <laughs> Is there um, any point to the existence of unsalted butter? This is my first question. Wait, to the existence? Okay, yeah. okay. And the second question is, have you ever considered opening a dive bar in Hudson, New York? Okay, let me let me do the first one. Um, unsalted butter is, um, yes. Unsalted butter is a must. Yeah, I would say other than toast, um, I almost all exclusively use unsalted butter to bake with. Because I want to have control over how much salt is in the recipe. And I have had some um, salts that are delicious, some butters that have salt that are delicious, but they taste like a salt lick. You know what I mean? They're just so intensely salty. And some even have like European, some European butters even have like big chunks of sea salt in them. So you can't control what your cookie will taste like unless you're using unsalted butter. It's because it's different levels of okay. salt. Okay, one of the things I have to mention because I've fall, recently fallen in love with, and I'll get back to your other question, <laughs> um, maybe, um, is uh, baking salt. It's, um, it's diamond crystal baking salt, and it's kosher salt that is ground really, really finely. And so it dissolves into a recipe. And the okay, this is gonna this is gonna excite you because I sometimes like, I don't know why I'm admitting this, but I'll go through a recipe and realize I forgot the salt in the recipe. And with this salt, you can add it at the end Ooh. because it dissolves that quickly. Well, you forget steps too. I know, I know, I didn't. Everyone felt and like I relieved. I just said that, and this is recorded, isn't it? Yeah, everyone feels relieved by that statement, by the way, because we all forget steps. <laughs> yeah, but it's really, so anyway, that's my new sort of baking yeah. love ingredient. The dive bar in Hudson, New York. Oh, and you. Shout you out guys to, are in cahoots. Shout out to Mel Bakery in, in, uh, in Hudson, New York, a, a great bakery in Hudson, Mel. Yeah. Okay, so my dream is to have a bakery during the day, a bar at night, and then have its sister situation in Venice, oh. I Italy. Oh, like twin restaurants. Yeah, like, so that I'm in one in the summer and one it's in the like, winter. Please, like we all can dream. We all can actualize too. Uh huh. I love that. It sounds I've like a TV it, show. And now it sounds recorded. like a TV show. Uh huh. Two more questions. There's got to be one there. I love this. Wow. Such a great idea. So it is Hudson, New York. Interesting. <laughs> Hi, Zoe. This oh is my... a great event. Um, so on your show, you have the um, vanilla. Uh, oh. the make your own vanilla. And of course, I did it. And I just have a question about it because I bought a beautiful jar bottle and put the beans in there and the vodka. And I capped it with a quirk. But mm -hmm. either evaporation is happening or someone's drinking the vanilla because it's going down and I'm not using as much as in the jar. So I'm wondering if yours does that. Is that something that's common or is it the quirk? It could be the quirk. Um, <laughs> you haven't had this happen to you? <laughs> um, I, I was looking at my son to see if he was drinking my vanilla. No, um, no, I don't. If it's corked, it's not evaporating. So somebody's drinking it <laughs> or using it or using it. Maybe they're making a lot of cookies. Um, no, I mean, but you can just refill it. Yeah, just keep refilling. That's hilarious. So there's DIY vanilla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm obsessed about... with uh, vanilla and making your own vanilla. Do you all make your own vanilla? Yay! 
great. Awesome. It's about half the crowd. Yeah, people. that's yeah. great. Um, so vanilla is super easy to make. And the reason that I love making homemade vanilla is because what you do is you get a bunch of van- vanilla beans. Um, you cut them down lengthwise. You scrape the seeds out. You stick them into a beautiful jar. And then you fill it up with vodka. And you shake it and you let that sit and mature for three months until it really gets a lot of color. The reason that I prefer that is because because you've scraped the seeds, you're also getting the intensity of the seeds in your vanilla. And so it just has this absolutely beautiful flavor to it. Um yeah, and then I just keep every time I use a vanilla bean in a recipe, I just add it to the jar. So I have one jar that I started in 2012. Um oh, and then I've cool. Yeah, I have because it's I like do the Solara method of vanillas. Uh, yeah, That's I cool. do um and then you just keep adding. I have one jar that I can't get any more beans into because it's so stuffed. Um, and I just keep adding vodka oh, to good. it. I love that. All right. Any final questions here? All right. There's one there. I think we might have actually time for one more after this one. Uh, hi. Um, I just have found that sometimes things are too sweet. Mm. So I've cut down on sugar. But is there like a magic ratio? Because you always hear the baking, you have to be more exact of sugar to, you know, to butter and yeah, I would like. say it depends what you're going for. So like a, a cookie, like that super crisp cookie that I was talking about earlier that spreads a lot, it has a lot of sugar in it because it spreads and it caramelizes. And that's kind of what makes the texture of it happen. Um Again, I would go back to that suggestion of making a small batch and try it the way that you want it to be um, because everybody's palate is different. And so if you want a cookie that's um, less sweet, the cookie lab is going to be very helpful for you because you'll see what happens if you reduce sugar as opposed to increase it. Um, And so depending on what you're going for, um, it may help you decide just how much to reduce and uh, what it will look like. So you can do it. Yeah. One last question. Um, I'm a big fan of your cake book. And sometimes there are recipes that are like three layer, nine inch cakes. And that's just too big for, you know, for me to make. And so how do you recommend, because I know like you can have a recipe, but I don't know what to do when it says like three eggs. How do I have that? And so how do you half it? And then also how do you adjust baking time for smaller tins? Yeah. Okay. So... I would say the best way to do it is bake with a scale Um, because then you can do a half a recipe simply. It's just it's just math. Um, When it comes to eggs, it's a little bit trickier because I know I hate it when I write a recipe that calls for three eggs because or five eggs. It's like, really? Um, But I do. So so, I'm sorry. (laughs) It's like a million, it's a billion dollar business. Good, like liquid eggs and just doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So what you can do is like beat the egg and do half or sometimes I'll do a yolk or sometimes I'll do a white, you know, um, I do apologize for that. Um, Okay. So what do you bake in? Are you doing like six inch pans? Yeah. Um, trying to take like a nine inch down to a six inch. A six inch. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so six inch, if you're taking a nine inch to a six inch, it's going to be about the same depth. Um, and so the baking time is not going to be as reduced as you might think um, because it's so deep, but it will for sure be reduced. And so There's no rule of thumb because it depends. Like if you're doing um, something like a Genois or a Chiffon, that's a very quick time. And if you're doing like a fruit cake or a, a pound cake, it's so much more time. There's not like a specific rule to this. If you have a cake, um, 
from my book that you're specifically interested in, um, you can always contact me on the website, um, on my newsletter. Those are the safest. People DM me on Instagram. And if you could see my DMs, <laughs> it's a wild place. Um, but please <laughs> be in touch through the website or my newsletter, and I can help you work out a specific recipe. That's so nice. What's the email for the podcast? Who, who, how do we email you? Or is it only DMs? Or is there a general inbox? There's, okay, I have to look it up. Okay. Because it's not my email. Oh, it's, it's going like... through my my newsletter okay. is on Substack. Okay. So it's Zoe Francois newsletter, Zoe Bakes newsletter, which I hope you're all definitely subscribe gotta into. subscribe um and then my website is zoebakes.com and you can leave a comment on any anything it can be totally unrelated and i'll find it i made that key lime pie this weekend by the way with cream cheese oh my god it's really really great not a cookie but a key lime pie thank you all thank you zoe francois for coming here what a great conversation your book is really so terrific fun. thank you crowd for coming thank you all for coming This is Taste is hosted by Eliza Abarbanel and me, Matt Rodbar. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things that are happening.